Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce the last speaker of the day. Um, so I just want to thank you all for attending Genetic Genealogy Ireland 2018. It is um, great to have uh, such a large audience uh, attending these lectures, and I'd just like to give a final thanks to our sponsors, Family Tree DNA, who have been so good to actually sponsor us for the last six years and allow us to indulge in our hobby. So if you can all take your seats, especially those of you at the back, we will then continue with the last lecture of the day, and it gives me pleasure to introduce John Cleary. Now John is a lecturer in linguistics at Harriet Watt University in, uh, is it Edinburgh? Edinburgh. Edinburgh. And um, in his spare times he runs a variety of different surname projects, uh, including the Kemp uh, and Cummings, Cummings. DNA, uh, surname DNA projects, but John is going to talk to us about why SNP testing, which he has done extensively in his projects, uh, and the future of whole genome sequencing. So please give a warm welcome for John Cleary. Thank you, Morris, and uh, thank you all very much for your endurance in staying to the, the very end. I hope it will not be the bitter end, it will be a very sweet end, in fact, to the, uh, the three days. which has been fantastic three days here at GGI 2018, as ever. Um, I, I better warn you, I am going to talk about, the, um, about why NGS testing, on the assumption that most of you, well, all of you, I hope, are familiar with it. So I'm not going to be talking at beginner's level <laughs> explaining um, the, the basic concepts of what a SNP is and how we test with it. So just to warn you in advance, um, if you're not familiar with SNP testing, you might find it disappearing into jargon quite quickly. Um, can I ask you how many of you have taken Y SNP tests for yourself or for a, a, a male relative? Yeah, so actually I think you're all quite familiar uh, with this. And of course I had a very good talk just now from John Brazel, which is also dealing with the, uh, a very similar topic. So what I'm going to do to try and wrap things up for this year is I want to do two things today. Um, I want to do a bit of a review of some of the new tools which are being offered by Family Tree DNA for their big Y test on the, on the site. So I'm only going to look at native tools today. I'm not going to look at um, any third party tools. And the main reason is, as most of you know, a year ago Family Tree DNA began the big process of converting their um, big Y database into HG38, the current human reference sequence. And this also led to a big revision uh, of what they offered, uh, eventually leading in the spring to their extending their test into the big Y500, offering in addition to the, um, the SNP read, the, um, the, 500, the panel of 500 uh, STRs, which were offered from um, April or May this year. And so the big Y became something, something quite different in the past year, and Family Tree DNA took the opportunity to improve the on-site tools, and I'll, I'll look at these in the course of the, of the, uh, the talk. And then, as I said in the, the title slide, I'm not going to make any um, declarations or predictions about the future, but I'm going to have a little glimpse into where the future could go um, in terms of why testing, in fact, I think where it is going. So we are talking really about the present that is shaping up into what the, uh, one version of the future. So first, the first part then, I'll begin by looking at um, the big Y test. So, as I'm sure most of you now know, um, it's an advanced SNP test. It uses next generation sequencing, and the aim is to sequence actual um, sequences of the Y chromosome. So, not reading the, the microsatellites, the STRs, and counting the number of repeats in those regions. It actually aims to read long stretches of the Y chromosome. It does not aim to read the whole Y chromosome because that cannot be done. There are at least half the Y chromosome today um, has not been sequenced for the reference sequence. Um, and there are other repetitive areas and areas that are deemed to be less useful for the needs of genetic genealogy. And so what Family Tree DNA did very wisely was offer a slightly um, cheaper version of uh, next generation sequencing that read important parts of the Y chromosome, but smaller regions of the Y chromosome than other tests. 
um, but could turn those tests around much more quickly and could concentrate on what was believed to be the areas most beneficial for uh, genetic genealogists to acquire data from. Um, so sometimes it's compared to it unfairly with a test by a competitor, but the two tests do very different things. However, we are moving into a period, I think, where we need to start asking whether the parts of the Y chromosome not read by the big Y test are those parts we now need to be looking at. Um, the um, big Y and other NGS tests are discovery tests. So the aim is to discover new SNPs that are not known before, or to find out whether you may have certain SNPs newly discovered which, which may belong in your branch of the family tree. And it's not to find out whether you may have certain, certain SNPs in a panel at a fairly um, historic or prehistoric or ancient level. It's to find out whether you may have new SNPs, um, not known, or ones that are very recent in terms of um, history and especially, um, especially genealogical history. Um, and in particular, the aim is to discover those branch-defining SNPs um, or to find ways to split apart big blocks of SNPs that can't be differentiated and splitting them into branches by finding people who are positive for some and negative for others, thus allowing you to make a branching. So it's all about discovery. It's about tree, tree building in the sense that STR testing was about asking questions about similarity and difference between testers which allowed you to infer how closely related they may be. SNP testing is about um, building the actual tree by working out how the, um, the SNPs rate, re relate phylogenetically and building the tree downwards from earlier ancestors. Um, and a few little facts, first of all, about the, um, or back information about the development of the Big Y. It was announced in October 2013, so it's five years old. And um, the first orders, the first results began coming in during the spring that followed. Um, and then by um, October 2017, a year ago, when I was in correspondence with Family Tree DNA about this, they had about 20,000 Big Y results in their database. Of these, about 18,500 were customer tests, um, and about another 1,500 were academic studies which have been commissioned by Family Tree DNA, probably as part of the, the background towards developing the, um, the Big Y 500 STR panel. Um, that's a year ago, there's certain to be several thousand more, I would guess probably another three or four thousand at least, um, as, this, as the, the, the rate of growth seems to be continuing um, at the same pace. Um, during, during last winter, we had the conversion of, uh, to the HG38 human reference sequence, as I mentioned, and the launch of the uh, 500 STR panel. So uh, uh, Family Tree DNA now um, offer um, 500 STRs, of which 111 are the well-known existing five panels, um, which are tested by a separate method, not part of the, uh, the big Y test, but are included within it if it's ordered from scratch. And then an additional minimum 389 STRs, possibly more, are read from the, the results of the NGS test itself. Um, I have some data here also from some third-party analysts. YFOL have at least uh, 15,000 results in their database. Again, they also have some academic sourced um, big Ys. They have some tests from other companies, and they have a large number of big Ys, but clearly only a subset of all the big Ys which have been done. So Family Tree DNA have the big, the big Y database. YFOL have a subset of that, but they're mixing it in with tests from other sources. And um, this may become important as we begin to move into a period where there may be more diversity of the kind of tests being taken. Um, Alex Williamson, very well known for the, the big tree, which is uh, very important for all people who are researching within the R1B Hapler group, including myself, as I'm a member of that, um, can use that as, a, as an amazing reference source with very detailed information about new SNPs discovered and about private SNPs of testers who have submitted their data to this third-party site. Um, again, there are also some academic uh, source studies uh, on that as well. Um, this is these are statistics from Alex Williamson's site. He constantly monitors or counts the number of um, kits that he's processed and put onto his tree. And this, these are the latest late figures. I, I, I updated these this morning and, and checked. Um, uh, they, they've probably changed since then because it seems to be constantly growing. Um, and this is a cumulative count down the side. 
Um, you can see how many kits per year are being uploaded, and the three colours represent um, P312, well, actually, no, R, 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 L21, so the most common um, SNP in, um, in Ireland, uh, and then the rest of P312 is the red, so these together are all P312. Um, and then in 2015-16, Alex began to upload an RU106, the other big um, R1B haplogroup results, to the uh, site as well. Um, and I think probably most of the attention has been given to the P312 um, data, um, which has, has been growing fairly steadily. I'll just go back to that page. Growing fairly steadily across the... Um, uh, the past few years, and although that seems, I thought there may be a, f a slowdown this year because we still have um, two and a half months to go. I suspect that by the end of the year we'll see a fairly constant growth in the L21. The others seem to have um, backed off a bit. There's obviously a bit of catch up here as a lot of um, kits were um, sent and processed by the big tree, but the, uh, uh, the, the U106 tree hasn't developed quite as fast as the other two. But of course, these are all linked to the, the YDNA warehouse. Um, which is offering a service for all haplogroup R people, and I believe in time they're offering an even better system than this, so we'll, we'll watch out for that. But again, we have an indicator here of growth, and of course, as you, as you are well aware, every um, Christmas, New Year, and during the summer, Family Tree DNA have big sale periods, which are now looked forward to eagerly by project, project administrators, who are usually ready um, with a test to order as soon as the price drops down to an affordable level. Of course, the thing about uh, NGS testing is, per SNP discovered, it's very cheap, but the cost of an individual test is very high. So the decision to make any kind of NGS test, whether the big Y or the ones I'll talk about later on, uh, is a matter involving investment and cost and weighing up what the gain is from the cost made. So I'm going to talk about um, the first one. I'll talk about three um, tools we've introduced by Family Tree DNA to the website. I did a, a mini review last year when they were brand new, and what I'm going to do now is, is look at them in the sort of cold light of a year of using these. Um, and I think generally they're, they're good tools, though they do have some shortcomings, and um, there, there's definitely some room for improvement of these. Um, the first one I'm going to look at is the, the Haplo Tree. And, of course, here's the familiar entrance page. I haven't blocked secret secretising names here because it's me. I'm letting my data all hang out here. Uh, so and I, I don't care who sees this. Um, it's, not my, it's not my address there. Whoops. Never mind. I don't care. Send me, send me letters. I don't mind. And, um, of course, you can click on the buttons here and... Uh, um, you have the familiar button here for the results, the matches, and the YSTR results are the new 500 panel. And there's also now a new button um, which will link to the public haplo trees, so, um, which we'll look at shortly. So th these are the two main tools we'll look at, uh, as well as the haplo tree, which is the stepped uh, matching system derived from the haplo tree and the, the, the Y chromosome browser, which from the tree DNA offer. So first of all, the haplo tree. Down here we have the view of the, the old haplo tree, which still exists, of course. And until September, this was um, contained only within the accounts of the testers. So you had to be a tester or a project admin to be able to see this. Um, and um, it became very detailed in the past two years as Family Tree DNA began to invest in the resources needed to update it, first updating it manually by receiving submissions from project project administrators, um, which also brought a bit of quality control into the process because in the older version of Big Y there were a lot of SNPs called which actually weren't that um, good for various reasons. And so the, the QC here was applied to put the ones which were worth um, putting the tree into the correct positions on the tree. And then by the time we moved into, uh, family tr into the Big Y 500, um, they began, we think, to use auto-calling. So there's now a more automated process, um, certainly in calling SNPs and putting names on new SNPs which are discovered so that now virtually every um, private SNP discovered in, in a Big Y test of quality is very quickly named by Family Tree DNA with a, a catalogue number beginning with BY and then a string of numbers, um, and there are um, six numbers in these names now. I think it's, it was up to BY 180,000. The last time I checked, it's probably even higher now. So that, that gives an indication of how many <coughs> SNPs have been discovered um, by Family Tree DNA. A small number of those will be duplicates, but a lot of them will now be unique SNPs um, discovered much more recently. And with the auto-calling, it's, it's, it's managed, they've managed to speed 
speed up the building of the tree. And I think it's still being vetted manually. I don't think it's being produced automatically, but it is now a very detailed um, haplotree, which contains every SNP shared by at least two testers. So if it's private, it doesn't go on until a second tester comes along and shares that in a meaningful relationship so you can identify a branch off the tree and family tree DNA then extend the haplotree. So they impress everybody in, in uh, late September when they put the haplotree um, onto public view. And this is the public view of, of the, the new Y haplotree. A little bit more recently they've also put the, the Mito uh, chondral haplotree online as well. And these can now be consulted by anybody. Um, so this, of course, is not a total tree of all SNPs discovered because there are, there are other companies who've run tests and have discovered SNPs that may not have yet made it onto this tree, particularly as there's now no longer a route for project admins to approach uh, family tree DNA um, to have other SNPs not discovered through Big Y added to the tree. Um, however, this is a very comprehensive tree of SNPs discovered in the Big Y. And I want to just go and look at it. I have it um, here somewhere. Uh, so Safari, yeah. Do it for you. Thank you, Morris. Thank you very much. Yeah. And so what you see on the, the front page is you'll see essentially just the top of it. So you see some branches of A, and you um, some from A L one thousand here at the top, and you can expand these branches by clicking on the. Um, well that's it. It'll disappear completely. So we'll. Uh, bring it back. Um, but in principle, you can expand the branches by, uh, that's very minus, wasn't it? Yes, it was. That, that, there's a plus there. So, so click on that, and we'll expand the branch um, down below it. Um, and of course, if you're an R person like me, you've got a long way down the alphabet, so um, the, the pages that have my SNPs on, for example, will be much further down. But I can go to the search box here, and then I've got search by branch name, so I can type R hyphen FGC5494, which is the sort of big branch SNP that I belong under within L21, and I can then search. And in theory, yes, there we are, it'll bring, bring us to there. Here it is. And the moment we're seeing here the, the country view. So what we have here are people arranged, or the, the data rather is, is categorised by origin. So we've got some Irish, uh, lot, lots of Irish there, but quite a few um, English, Scots, and Brits who are neither English nor Scottish, we have some of those too, and um, Swiss down there, I think, and a Canadian, and so on. So it depends how useful that information is. Of course, that's telling us where the modern-day testers live. So we can also go up here and choose a different view. We can uh, arrange it by surname. And here I'm not quite sure how they're developing the tree because um, the data mainly disappears. And there are a few surnames here. We've got a Warren here, we've got a Griffin, McFarland, a Bush, a Tyre or Thyre and a McFarland down here, a few more surnames down here. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how they are putting the surname data onto this. Um, it may be something to do with whether or not the tester has allowed public access to the data in, in, within projects, but I'm not, I'm not quite sure what the criteria are here. That's maybe something that could be clarified in the future. And you can also choose a SNP view, or variance view, which allows you to see all the other SNPs which are equivalent at that level. So here we have, for example, um, choosing, going back to my own um, branch here, if I click it open, obviously we've got uh, 144 branches here. I'll scoot down a little bit further to find where I am. That's me, Y996, Y1991. Click again, there's only three here now, and that's me there. That actually, that little branch is moi. And these um, SNPs here are the equivalents in that block. So this A7633, and all of these are SNPs that I have since the last branching point. And there's no one um, more recently who can form further branches with these. But one goal of Y testing in the future could be to find other people who will split that branch by having some of those SNPs but not the others, and then we can create a new branch on the tree. Anyway, so th there are quite a few open to the public reference trees uh, for Y SNPs around. This will be one of the most powerful, if only because it has uh, the results from every big Y test in it. And there are, uh, there are some SNPs certainly from um, tests from other companies, and I imagine that in the future Family Tree DNA will accept more submissions <coughs> from project administrators to make this tree um, as comprehensive as possible. So this may well evolve to be the most comprehensive collection of SNP branches that there is out there. Um, this doesn't necessarily mean it will re replace older trees you may all be familiar with 
with the, the ISO tree, for example. The ISO tree serves a purpose because the SNPs on that tree are supposed to be academically verified to a very high um, standard um, and very strict criteria. So therefore you can be sure that the SNPs logged on that tree are of better quality or more verified than maybe appearing here. This is only an experimental tree, but I imagine this is the kind of tree that most um, project admins and testers will come to, to refer to because of the sheer quantity of data that it holds. So that's a tree, and I'll say the, the tree is a big success. Um, for family tree DNA, I would say big tick, um, 9 out of 10 for the public tree. Um, only 9 because I think there's, there's questions over the way they're um, recording the surnames. I'd like to see a bit more information about that. But uh, a very useful resource, I think. So going on to the next tool, then. The, the next two tools are, if you like, native tools within the family tree DNA site, um, as opposed to third-party tools uh, on other sites. And so here we have the, the stepped matches list, which is derived from the haplotree. And the intention is to show the tester how many uh, matches they will have at the four levels on the tree above where they sit. So this person apparently sits within this subclade called YP983. And uh, they have three matches within that. And then there are some further branches above that with uh, steadily increasing numbers of matches. So this is actually potentially, again, a very useful um, system because one of the things we want SNPs to do is to sort matches. And here we can see um, the, the matches arranged in order of distance according to the branch on the tree. And presumably as you further split some of these blocks, you'll then get more and more branches further down. The, the problem comes, and I think there is a problem with this, is a very useful way of displaying information. This is um, my matches um, page. Here again is the SNP we just looked at, and here's me down here. And here's one of my matches, some of the Cleary somewhere, uh, who matches me. And we see that we have two non-matching variants, which are uh, a BY SNP and one that hasn't got a name yet. Um, this one hasn't a name because it's in a slightly suspect area, but that's in me, so that's a SNP that I've acquired. Whoops, it's, it's going to keep falling off. That I've acquired since um, splitting from this person, and that's um, this one. The other one is not in me, so it must be in the other Cleary. So we each have a, a little private SNP there, which we can use, of course, for further research. Um, the problem with this, I think, is that it works for some people, not for others. and. Although it does seem to be a very neat way of classifying your matches by distance, it also seems to be limiting the, the view of matches that we have. Um, and just for example here, this person who's a member of one, one of the projects I work on has no matches at all. And how can that be? Well, Family Tree DNA have set um, a 30-SNP limit. So going back to those non-matching variants, if you have more than 30 variants that you don't match with somebody else, then you will not see them on your matches. So that's rather like the, the STR matching system, where you only see people who match you, say, within 4 out uh, four of 37 or 7 out of 67. So here it's been determined that if you have uh, 31 or more uh, non-matching variants with somebody, and it could be... 17 for you, 14 for them, or whatever, then you won't see them as a match. So this person seems to be so distant from any other potential match, even within these subclades, that they do not see them. And I think that's a slight problem, because they're sharing these brand subclades with uh, other testers which they cannot see. This is a slightly better um, case here. Um, and this one even better, so this person, rather like me, can see a few more people higher up. But the, the point is that each of these three um, charts is actually a descendant from this. So this is seen as the major branch marker, and this person, rather arbitrarily, can see over 13 people at that level, whereas these people can see far fewer or no matches at all, despite belonging to the same subclade. Now, th there is an argument that there's a case for limiting the number of matches you see, so you're not bombarding people who are not related to you in any meaningful historical period with emails for information. But I think that, that's a very weak argument, because part of what these tests are about is to develop understanding descent over far more than just the, the, the genealogical surname use period. And people are interested in deeper origins and do want to build um, diagrams and maps of surname clusters 
how different surnames may relate to each other um, from early, early in the, the, the use of surnames. And so it does seem to be a bit limiting. Um, and I think I, I, would, I, I would call for 30 snip difference to be simply removed and to allow people to see um, any matches they have within the selected branches. There's also an issue, given that all three of these come from different, uh, from the same subclade, shouldn't they be seeing the same standardised set of branch markers, rather than ones that are simply arbitrarily the four immediately above where they are on the tree? So to illustrate this in a slightly different tree, there's one which um, we've developed within the project. This is the same um, diagram, by the way. This, this, there's the uh, YP355 up the top, and here we have some divisions. And the person who has no matches at all is down here. And so because of all these SNPs they have, plus all the SNPs other people may have, including people in their um, slightly higher subclades, plus ones that may not be declared on the tree, um, then including, including private SNPs, they're deemed to be too far away to see any of the other matches. And just to illustrate here, this person down here is able to see up to this point, this person here can see up to this point. This person here is able to see up to here. And this person, because there's less definition here in the tree, is able to see much farther up to the, R, the, the R1A um, uh, L448 marker, um, which means they can see a lot of people in a parallel sub-branch down here. So again, it does seem to be a little bit unbalanced in what's on offer. And I think while the step assorted in matching is potentially useful, the way it's um, implemented um, actually puts barriers up um, for building connections. Then the other big tool that Family Tree DNA um, developed last year is the Y chromosome browser. And this is actually very potentially very useful. And um, it allows us to see such things as the, the length of the Y chromosome that's covered in the test. And we can also see all the individual reads um, stacking up at different parts, different locations on the Y chromosome. We can see where the SNPs may be with a SNP uh, apparently appearing here. Um, since the reference sequence at the top shows a T, and here every read is showing a C, so again there's a fairly firm call of a SNP there. Um, and a few, more, a few more views here. If you hover your mouse over a column, you can get some information about it, telling you, for example, that this position is um, derived, because again, there's a reference sequence, a T, and here's an A, almost all the way down. That one's not, a, not an A. The ears must be too narrow, I think. It's falling off. Put your arm through there. Okay. And I'll try doing it that way. All right. That might help. That's cool. Can you yeah. wind up? That sounds even louder than I see that. than it was. Okay, so I'll, I'll, just, I'll just do like this, like, like, like a folk singer, and sing to you. Okay. Um, so the... Um, yeah, so here we have a little bit of use of information. Um, even given there's a confidence limit, uh, confidence uh, rating, um, and again, there's some limitations here because uh, some of you may be familiar with the, um, the online genome browser I IGV, which allows you to upload a, a BAM file and you get a similar interface to this, showing mapping out the reads and um, giving you more useful information, I think, than this version does. Um, for example, if you want to know how many A's there are down this column and how, and how many um, non-derived um, reads there are, you have to count them physically, you have to run down counting each one uh, and then, then work, out, work out your own ratios. And it would be quite useful, I think, if they could um, introduce a little information box up here. If you clicked on the reference sequence, and as you can in, uh, in IGV, you could then get summary information telling you about this position um, and, um, without having to go down and count it yourself. So again, I think there's some scope for improvement here. Um, the, the confidence limit, the confidence information they give here, uh, again, applies to each individual read. It would be quite useful to have more information about the, the confidence of the overall call. So again, this summary information could be provided um, up here. But um, it, it, it is potentially a very useful way of visualising results. Um, while not being especially powerful, um, as if you're checking the positions it's called in your test, so in other words, if you're checking your non-matching variants or checking your known SNPs, then you can see how they look. And you can see, for example, um, that this has got far fewer reads um, than somewhere else. I think there's less than 10 here, aren't there? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So with, with um, 11 reads, um, family tree DNA would, would presumably call this as a SNP. But if there are fewer than, than 10 reads, chances are it wouldn't. And there's a chance here you can find such calls and evaluate them for yourself. 
Um, you can also find calls like this, where the um, which may which may not be called. So you can pull out positions from your your VCF file um, and try and find them, which does take a bit of ingenuity. And then you can find out information about why something that appears to be a SNP may actually not be a SNP. Here we see these faded. Um, reads are actually poor quality, therefore the good quality ones are pulling the SNP, um, the poor quality ones are not, and that may or may not be called, but well, that probably will not be called by family tree DNA because there are only four good quality reads, but of course some other third party tester may call that as a SNP, and it's useful to be able to look at this visually and uh, get further information about it. Um, I'll just skip on to the, the summaries here. It's pleasantly designed, it looks very pleasant on the eye, um, but the, the data is very, very limited. Um, because we have to do physical counting of the information ourselves, um, and because the quality rating is also limited, um, if you discover you have an additional variant not given in your list, then there's me a means here to investigate it. However, you can't navigate to any position on this. Um, at least you can't easily navigate to any position on this. Uh, you can only click on the on the uh, the list of SNPs it gives you in your results file. However, if you know how to um, write HTML, you can go into the HTML code of the page, and you can set any position you want to look at, and you can then take yourself there. It's kind of a, a hack, and it's a bit a bit inelegant, but it's possible to uh, force this to take you to any position you may want to look at. But again, it'd be easier if Family Tree DNA would, would just create a search box and allow you to go to any position you wanted to look at across the Y chromosome and see what the result is there and, uh, and find out if there are any other um, positions you may want to look at. Um, and this goes back to the panel discussion we just had. There's no comparison ability with other testers as there is in the, the brand new version of the autosomal um, chromosome browser which they've just introduced. Would that be desirable? I don't know. I'll, I'll, I'll leave us to think about that over the time being. So that's um, a quick run through the, these new tools, um, and because it's the final talk of the day, I'm going to push things on quickly, and uh, I was asked to talk about um, the possibilities for the future, if only because I think we're moving into a future where we're likely to see uh, demand for more coverage in tests of the Y chromosome, and in particular we're all, I think, beginning to hear more and more about the possibilities for whole genome sequencing. So I've got, I've got a few pointers here. I've got no answers really. I've been trying to acute, put together information I can from those who are in the know about these things, but also from the very first um, test results which are being posted uh, and discussed um, in discussion groups. So there are some limitations then with the big Y. Good test as it is, as I say again, I think it's done tremendously well because it's relatively inexpensive for NGS testing. It's limited in the amount of coverage it has of the, the Y chromosome, but it's done a good job very well. However, there are many parts of the um, um, Y chromosome not sequenced. And, of course, other tests which cover more of the Y chromosome are finding SNPs here, which can give us, for example, more precise age calculations, if you're interested in that kind of thing, and can also find SNPs that may be able to break apart some of the, the stubborn blocks that won't be, won't, won't be split. There's also a limitation with the length of the reads. So the, um, the current NGS tests read fragments or parts of fragments up to 150 base pairs in length, um, and again, these have been reassembled into, into a read of the, the Y chromosome. And again, there are some limitations in what they can do, in particular in, in the, the case of trying to extract STRs. So if you want to try and get more STRs from the Y chromosome through um, NGS testing, then once again, the 150 base pair reads are a problem there. So therefore, other methods might be, might be able to be developed that can give better coverage. That's more length and deeper reads of the Y chromosome, uh, higher quality SNP calls, uh, more Y SNPs, other parts of the, the Y chromosome, increasing the resolution of, of these uh, historical trees within historical time, um, more reliable calling of STRs, and the costs will remain an issue, but we're at the, at the point where some of the costs of whole genome sequencing tests are beginning to come down, so they're not actually that far away from the, the costs paid for specialist Y tests. Um, 
I'm going to come back to this one because the first thing we're going to look at, um, I've got three potential ways in which we, we can move into it in the future. So one, one potential way, and some of you may have seen a question I posted on Facebook in the last few days to test people, um, people's ideas about this out, is, is there any, any scope for moving towards a kind of dedicated Y SNP chip? So taken taken from the uh, from the uh, the micro array technology used by autosomal testing, to develop a Y SNP chip that will contain all the SNPs discovered by big Y testing and, if possible, by other um, testing companies as well. Um, there are about 118,000 um, SNPs on the FC DNA haplotree, tree, um, which means there's plenty of room uh, on, on a chip. And the autosomal chips contain 600,000 um, SNPs, genome-wide SNPs upwards. So there's plenty of room on them for uh, on those certain chips for those and more besides. Um, there are probably another I don't know 100,000 or more private SNPs um, currently uh, in circulation which haven't yet been paired with a second tester. And of course this could be a way in which you begin to find quite cheaply people who may match others um, on those private SNPs rather than commissioning um, one or several MGS tests to get someone just to match on a single or on two private SNPs. If they were put onto, onto a microarray, then maybe a, a cheap test could be taken to find people who may match the, the testers who discovered those private SNPs. Um, so the question is, is it, would it be economical to do this? Could, uh, could any company take on the design of such a SNP, marketing it? Of course, once it was designed, it was very hard to change. So as new discovery tests were, uh, were going on, those new SNPs wouldn't be on this chip. But maybe we, it's possible to reach a stage where there's a certain saturation of SNP discovery that may allow a, a pause in which a, a fairly cheap test could be developed to allow other people to find out more cheaply whether they actually match the existing SNPs. Um, of course, discovery testing will continue, but maybe this could be, could be an additional um, way forward. So the, the disadvantages uh, are it could distract from discovery testing. You may get people saying, I've done that test, I've, I've had my Y read, I'm happy with that, that that's all I need. And therefore, there's a, there may be a slowdown in discovery of new private SNPs. Um, but, but as I say, it could be a potential uh, cheaper route for, uh, for developing... Um, whoops for developing uh, Y testing in the future. So now I'm going to go back to the, the slide I've skipped. So I want to just put a, a couple of definitions here because as I move into talking about the other kinds of um, NGS tests that we may move into, uh, a lot of the comparison between them depends on numbers. We, I'm going to throw, throw lots of numbers at me now. But particular kinds of numbers uh, assessing how much coverage these new tests will give us. So, for example, what kind of length coverage? If we want more of the Y chromosome to be red, then therefore there needs to be more positions on the Y red. The big Y at the moment can read something like 12 to 14 million. I think the current HD38 BAM files are usually producing reads of 12 million. Yet it's said that the, um, the readable space on the Y chromosome is about 25 or 26 million positions. So the big Y is targeting about 45% of the readable Y, and there's more of it which could be read in, in other tests. Then we have depth coverage, so the number of times a particular position is read in a test. So a test may aim to read the, um, the, the, the sequence that's being read 15 times, 20 times, 30 times, 50 times, and therefore the number of times the, um, the, the, the reads are done will improve the, the resolution of the test. Um, and therefore, how many times is, is necessary to achieve a satisfactory and quality? Of course, the more times a sequence is read, the more expensive the, the test is going to be. So there's a trade-off between cost and, uh, and, and read depth here. So the question is, would the, the whole genome sequence of the tests offering, say, 15x, 15 times read depth, would they be able to compete with the kind of results we're getting from the two big existing uh, Y tests of the day? Um, and then, of course, the reads are the fragments. So here, here we, we see the, the reads piling up. So here we see the certain read depth. That's the number of times this position has here been read. Um, looks to be about, about 20 times, roughly 15 or 20 times. Um, other, other positions are read more frequently. So once a test is actually done, every position on the Y will actually be read a different number of times. It may be read just once. It may not be read at all. It may be read uh, two or three hundred times in certain pileup regions which seem to accumulate more reads. So you'll end up, once a test is done, you can compare the actual, the, uh, the median or the, or the average um, read 
um, depth that's been achieved in the test, and this can then be an indicator of the degree of quality um, being achieved. Um, and of course, as I said earlier, at the moment, um, NGS tests are based on reading fragments of 150 base pairs, so is it possible to increase that? Um, is a possibility of seeing longer reads being conducted in the future. So to answer that question first, scoot forward again, the, the second test I'm going to look at involves long read technology. So we've, we've all heard about things like the um, nanopore sequencer, sequencer uh, offering the, the potential of long reads, which may be anything from 10,000 bases long up to 100,000 bases long, depending on the, the technology. The, these are actually being used. They haven't been applied to genealogy yet, and I don't know how long it may be before they are, because the, these will be expensive. Uh, when it comes to the kind of applications that we put them to. But um, just recently, um, yeah, if, if we can um, get longer read lengths, we can do things like start to bridge those long repetitive sequences which aren't read in the Y tests at the moment. Uh, for example, the DYZ19 sequence, where a lot of SNPs have been called, but some people say, well, are they reliable? Because of the, the degree of repetitions in that sequence means we can't accurately sequence them or be absolutely certain where these SNPs actually sit. Um, so longer read lengths may allow um, for more of the Y to be read. They'll also allow more calling of STRs. Since STRs are, are short repeating sequences, um, but they may repeat for longer, than 150 um, base pairs. So therefore, if, a, if an STR is longer than the length of the reads in the test, um, you're, have, you're trying to read it by stitching together two or more reads, and therefore there may be some scope for mistake, for error. So if your reads are longer, you may capture more STRs within the test. <clears throat> and it also allows the possibility of de novo sequencing, of compiling a sequence of, uh, of DNA without mapping directly uh, onto a reference sequence. So, we, we do have the first kind of long read test um, currently in progress. These have actually been eagerly awaited, I think, for about two years. These have first been discussed a couple of years ago. Um, and I believe the first results are coming in from a technology known as synthetic long read sequencing, uh, which are being offered by, by Full Genomes. Um, they are very expensive, about $2,900 at the moment, because they are the absolute peak of, of Y testing. But um, there have been some um, initial orders being made um, to test out what they can offer. And essentially, they're not actually, strictly speaking, long reads because they're still using the 150 base pair reads that we're familiar with. But they have a, a prior stage where they fragment the, um, the sequence into 10,000 base um, strands, which are then segregated and, and labelled, and then you carry out the, um, the, the fragmentation and the reading of the fragments. But because these strands have all been um, prior um, separated and labelled, it's possible to then uh, reconstruct these into, into those effectively um, 10,000 base pair reads. Um, and I, I've, I've no idea how, how, how um, accurate these may be, but it does seem as if it's a way of achieving uh, kind of a pseudo long read uh, effect. And I've a little information here, because the first tests are now being analysed by the project administrators who ordered them. And it seems as if they, they're definitely extending the... Um, the sequence of the Y chromosome that can be read to at least 16 million base pairs, um, with possibly usable data on up to 20 million base pairs. So we're looking at potentially 80% here of the, the readable Y. Um, I mean, the, the read depth apparently is not very high, so they're not sure that this is going to be terribly useful at the moment for STR recovery. Um, but it is increasing the rate of SNP discovery, um, because more SNPs are being discovered on those other um, regions. And in particular, there's a suggestion from Alex, Alex Williamson that it may allow us to identify the true position of the palindromic <coughs> SNPs. If any of you have a SNP with a ZZ number, uh, as I do, this is on one of the palindromes, which are these sort of doubled strands that uh, mirror each other. And at the moment, you can't be sure which palindromic arm uh, one of these SNPs sits on. Uh, but apparently, Alex Williamson believes that this long read technology will allow those to be sequenced and those SNPs possibly to be identified um, in, the, the, in the, the true position. So a comment here from Ian McDonald, who kindly informed me about the, um, the tests that are coming in. He thinks that if these um, projections actually are correct, the long read tests have the power to make a measurable distance difference in several families I know about, including my own. It will also make a measurable difference to the accuracy of the ages that we can define statistically from the results. 
uh, which may be 20% more accurate than current projections. He, he also goes on to remind us that at the current cost level, it's not likely to be uh, a first choice for most testers. However, it's happening, and so there's this one new application um, of, of long read technology. So whole genome sequencing, then, this is what, I think, what many people are increasingly looking to, and noticing that the apparent, the headline cost, shall we say, of, of a whole genome test, a sequencing test, or WGS, is not that far off the cost of the, the current Y-capture tests. Um, we've probably become familiar this year, I think, with the potentials of, of uh, WGS testing, particularly through cases like the, the Buckskin Girl, um, and the ability um, of people to create spoof files, which mirror the um, selection of SNPs on the microarrays, and this allow you to compare directly data pulled from a whole genome test with the, um, the data derived in the conventional Family Finder or Ancestry or 23andMe um, autosomal tests. So WGS generates massive amounts of data, and they're often distributed to testers on hard drives, on, on physical media, or by a very, very big download. Um, and of course, there are no um, WGS databases available, as there are with Big Y, um, allowing genealogists to compare the results with other WGS tests. Um, but of course, you can spoof the files, and in particular, uh, Yful.com are now producing or generating BAM files, Y chromosome BAM files, from WGS um, um, data, which can then be compared with um, the, um, the Y-BAM files they have on their database, submitted from, B, from big Y and FGC tests. Um, what apparently what they do once they pull the, the Y-BAM data is they then discard the, the non-Y data. So there are some real raising issues, questions about submitting a whole genome sequencing file to a third party um, supplier. Um, and again, people have to decide their, their risk tolerance of things like that. But Wifel do say they discard the non-Y data and generate a comparable Y-BAM file from the, uh, from the, the Y data. So here's where I'm going to throw some, some numbers at you then. Um, because if you try and find out about um, WUG's testing, you'll get a multiplicity of cost levels. I'm not going to talk about the companies and the costs. That's, um, I think that's beyond the scope of this particular talk. But there, are there are various levels, tests offered at 15x reads, 30x reads, 50x reads. Um, there are some smaller ones, I think, that are disappearing from the market. There's general recognition that 15x is probably the minimum you'd want to order if you want to get the kind of quality of, uh, of Y reads to compete with the, the current um, uh, Y tests. And what I have here then are some, some data about coverage and read depth, which we're, which we're finding pulling from the, the current existing uh, NGS Y tests. I don't have very much information about um, Y Elite. What I have here I've taken from the, the ISOG uh, Y SNP chart, which I think is now needing some updating. Um, but with the, the, the two big Y uh, versions, I pulled these from uh, files available to me from projects, and uh, which are a, an, an, an anonymized. And here we have the old big Y prior to the HG38 changeover. Um, and it's interesting that actually, before HG38, they had higher, uh, apparently higher length coverage than they do now, and higher um, median uh, read depths. But it's clear there's also a very wide range of reads across the individual positions in the old test, uh, ranging from a single read in some positions up to 8,000 in some, in some cases. Um, and there are also far more actual reads read in the old Big Y test than there are now. So it seems if one of the um, effects or factors within the conversion to HG38 has been to filter out a lot of reads that probably shouldn't have been in here that may belong on other chromosomes. So what we now, now have is a, a slimmer um, tests that may be more targeted on, on the Y chromosome. So the big Y at the moment is achieving read depths of about, around about 20x and covering about 40 to 45% of the readable Y. Uh, hold the, hold the, uh, the other ear now. And um, is um, estimated by those who do these kind of estimations to be generating a new SNP on average um, roughly every 125 years. Now, some of you may be sceptical about the, uh, the age calculations on small samples of recent historical data, but of course they, these, these averages are calculated going back over several thousands of years, and uh, they are a kind of, a, of, a, of an index of the number of SNPs being generated from a test. So, um, 
Let's compare these then with some of the uh, works tests available. So this, these are coming from um, some tests produced by Dante Labs and YSeq. Um, and Dante are offering 30x works tests at the moment. YSeq are offering 15, 30 and uh, 50x reads. Um, and additionally, uh, the Four Genomes Corporation are also offering tests at 15 <coughs> and 30x. Uh, I don't have any data about them, but recently some people have taken these tests, posted their um, basic statistics. I've just turned myself off. Yeah, we might have done. Yes. Or I'll give well, the battery's gone. It probably is the battery gone. Yes. And I would like to take this thing off my ear now and scream. Yeah. <laughs> Before it finally falls away. <laughs> okay, there you go. Thank you, Morris. Thank you very yeah. much. Um, and so. Um, I'm trying to put together what, what may be indexing to give us some indication of where these are going. So um, I do have some data from uh, which arrived just this afternoon uh, on the, the, the length coverage of the, uh, the two YC tests. So I'll just get up the photograph I took earlier. And so along the top row, we're seeing that the, the Dante labs are in two tests are producing around about um, 25 to 6 million um, megabase pairs in their, in their reads. And um, the 102% there, don't be misled by that, that looks a bit bizarre, but that's, that's what Weifel um, declared in their analysis of this uh, BAM file, presumably based on, a, on a, an assumption that the uh, readable Y is about 25 and a half million base pairs long, so they appear to be now exceeding that in length. And actual fact, the other two tests um, are producing figures very, very similar to this. So the, the YSeq 15 and the, the YSeq uh, 50 are both producing about 26 million. So around about the same. Um, and the, the median read depth is about 20x for the, the, um, the Dante lab, aiming for 30, achieving 21. The, the YSeq 15, aiming for 15, achieving 14, in one, one test I have here. The YSeq 50, aiming for 50, achieving uh, 41. X reads. Now, um, the people who are taking these tests are suggesting that what the 50x test gains is not necessarily um, deeply improved SNP calling. That seems to be good enough at a 30x level at least, maybe even at 15x. But what it's, what it's doing is it's improving the quality of STR calls. So along the bottom, um, in the middle rather, here we see the number of reliable um, STR calls being uh, made by Dante Labs, about just under 500, um, with YC achieving about 520. YC do offer a SNP verification package as part of their test. And in the, the 50x, achieving about 550 um, reliable STR calls. And the people who ordered these tests did so because they wanted those STRs. Their uh, particular question that they were trying to um, um, uh, elaborate depended not just upon SNP calls, but also upon establishing a very rich bank of STRs to try and force new branches onto their tree. And um, along here, again, as I showed you, the big Y is achieving roughly 125 uh, years per SNP. So it seems as if the, the Dante labs are with 30x, getting up to about 85. I believe that's comparable to the FGC Y leads test. Um, the 15x uh, Y seek, um, not quite as good because, again, there's probably more single read or low read um, positions in the 15x test, which a 30x test would eliminate. And the, the Y seek 50x, achieving about 78 years per SNP, again, comparable to what Ian thinks the, um, the synthetic long read technology can uh, achieve. Um, so just to move on away from this, here's some more qualitative thoughts about these uh, from the, the people who shared their, uh, their data with us. Um, and I'll, I'll just, just let you glance these over, uh, particularly I think from Tim down here, um, he's, he was suggesting that the, um, the SNP results, the 15x, are about as good as the, the, the 50x, um, but the, the 15x finds about 30 less reliable STRs than the 50x. So uh, if, if STRs are what you're trying to pull from these tests, then you would need more resolution. If you're interested in just expanding the regions where SNPs are being read, then the 15 or the 30 may offer enough. Why is this important? Well, essentially, it's all down to the decision you make about how much money you, you want to spend. So 15x um, WGS tests 
can now be um, ordered for as little as $700, or even $650, I think. The, the Dante um, Labs 30X is even cheaper, um, but of course, if you want more quality, if you want a 50X test, that will then cost a lot more. So there are decisions we made initially about what degree of resolution you go for before you decide to um, order one of these tests. Uh, and therefore, it may be wise to wait, I think, for the, the market to settle a bit before you go in if you're not quite sure what it is you're trying to get from them. But it seems likely that I think as we move into the future, we are going to see more and more um, BAM files being generated from these tests and adding to the, the bank of SNPs in the places that the big Y can't reach. Um, I want to finish by just talking about the, um, the, the big Y 500 or the panel 6 STRs, these new 389 upwards um, STRs added to the, the big Y 500 last year. And again, the initial reaction, I think, from most people who've received these results is that they seem to be very stable, very slow moving, hardly moving at all. So a lot of the data seem to be very, very samey um, across um, projects and across branches. Um, but however, there's th some thoughts here from Dave Vance, who's been doing a study of these um, SNPs, um, of these STRs rather, and he suggests that these um, panel six STRs um, are mutating so slowly that they can actually be almost seen as being rather SNP-like. And so he, he seems to see them as almost um, pseudo SNPs. There we are. Um, Give you one example here. In other words, they provide one more source of um, slow moving uh, mutation that once you see it, it'll probably be stable for long enough for it to be treated as a de facto historical or genealogical branch marker. So, again, these, um, I think the jury is still out on how useful these new STRs are going to be. But there's still some work to be done, I think, on understanding them and finding what can be pulled from them um, in the future. So that's just a few, a few thoughts about where the future may go. Um, if you're confused, well, actually, so am I. I've been watching the, the prices of the, the works tests um, for, for over a year now, wondering, should I do it? Should I go in now? Should I wait? If I do it, which one would I order? What do I really want to know? And I think that we're still at that kind of stage. But I think some clarity is now beginning to emerge from the people who are very kindly posting up their, their statistics and their test results. We're now beginning to see what is possible, what can be done from these, um, from these tests. And I think they're fairly shortly going to become part of the, the scenery of... Um, uh, why NGS testing. I don't think they will replace the existing <coughs> NGS tests for the time being, but they definitely will cause a, a challenge, I think, to them, and uh, of course a rethink to all of us about whether if we are going to spend money on these kinds of tests, do we want to do it in such a way that would close off data um, that we need to have? Maybe we should spend the money, get the best test we can to achieve the most data we can in, in a single one-off test. So thank you very much. Um, that's uh, all the time for Dave and all we have time for, I think, but um, well, close enough, but thank you yeah. very much, John. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, great. Um, uh, questions for John. We have about five or ten minutes left for questions, so uh, Daryl is saying no, but we can be kicked out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> have we, locked, have we uh, packed up and everything yet? Oh, good. Okay. James, speak into my uh, microphone. Two, two quick things. One on um, Big Y and Big Y 500. I saw your slide had 125 years for uh, Smith average uh, for, for the second one. With question mark. Question mark, yeah. Is that question mark because we don't know? Or is that question mark because the initial findings are that it is the same? No, it's because I'm, I think we can't assume that the, um, the rates will be the same as the old big Y. Yeah, I think yeah. it's going to be quite different, much yeah. lower. Sure. Uh, and the other thing is, has anybody found any use for these extra SGRs? Well, I think just what Dave Vance is saying here, um, and he's he's interacting with. No, he's actually pointing to a particular case which has been useful to someone in the discussion which this um, this thread came from. So there's one case where someone has actually got a SNP-like STR that can be useful as a branch marker. Good on it. <laughs> Great. Okay. Well, we have to call it an end there. But I uh, just want to say a big thank you to uh, John Cleary for a wonderful presentation. And all of you for attending DJI 2018. Thank you. Um, can we all say a big thank you to Morris, who's been yes. sitting here yes. patiently for three days, sharing his <laughs> Sorry, folks.
No, because it's the one out to the right. Where you actually been, say, where you, where you 